Welcome to Keep You 100 Radio. I'm your host, Felicity Pointer, type 1 diabetic, certified health coach, personal trainer, and founder of Needles and Spoons Health and Wellness. Inside this podcast, you'll find the real and raw conversations around diabetes management, including the lessons that we don't learn in our endos office, my best tips and trainings, and conversations from the experts that I trust inside the community so that you can create more predictability in your diabetes management and feel empowered while doing so. Let's dive in. What is up, friends? Welcome to another episode of Keep 100 Radio. If you are new here, welcome to the podcast. If you are not new, welcome back and thank you so much for rejoining us. I am so excited for today's episode because this is truly the information that I wish I had when I was first diagnosed. So if you are new here, then maybe you don't know, but I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I was 19 years old. And I'm sure if you're in the same boat, then you know that that is a long time to go through life without having to work as your pancreas and to have a diagnosis like this. So obviously that comes with a huge learning curve. So when I was diagnosed, you know, this was back about eight years ago. So social media was definitely a thing, but it wasn't as prevalent as it, as it really is today. So that being said, there wasn't really much information online other than through like the ADA, JDRF, all those organizations, but there wasn't, you know, social media in the context of that there were coaches and that there were um, medical professionals posting online from that real life perspective there weren't really other diabetics to connect to if it wasn't through things like Facebook and at that time I don't even know if Facebook groups were really a thing yet so it was just very different than probably being diagnosed in kind of like this year kind of time frame. And I'm sure if you're listening to this and you were diagnosed years and years and years ago, like 20 years ago, you're like, Lissy, like <laughs> you're spoiled. You had at least that much. So I totally hear you. But, but when we break it down, you know, diabetes really is like learning a new language. And not only is it like learning a new language, but it's kind of one that we have to do pretty reluctantly. Like we didn't ask for this. We didn't ask to be, have to learn this. So, you know, not only does it change the way that we take care of our body and the way that we look at food, but there's all these different, you know, terms and ways of thinking that when you don't know or you're not being taught in your endos office what these things mean, it's kind of like you don't know what you don't know. There's kind of this whole other world of taking care of your body and this whole other world of diabetes management that maybe isn't being taught to you in your endocrinologist office. So with that being said, you know, I went a few years, you know, three to four years of kind of this black and white thinking of, okay, you know, I have my, my insulin pen or my insulin pump and I take my insulin for whatever carbs I'm eating. And that's kind of it. But when social media became more prevalent and I started connecting with more people online, I started learning all these new terms and what they meant in context of how I could now take care of myself or just, you know, different things to consider or different information to look at. So I really want to make this episode as that resource for anybody who may have been diagnosed maybe in the past year or so, or maybe just somebody who hasn't gotten curious enough to really branch out into those other forms of education or, you know, those different communities where this information maybe is sitting. But not only that, but I don't want you to have to like dig for that information. I want it to be all in one place. So what I'm going to do inside this episode is take you through a few definitions of words that I didn't know even really existed until I joined the diabetes online community. And not only did understanding these words, you know, make it easier for these interactions with other members of the community, but they truly changed the way I thought of my management and kind of opened up new tools that that then I could utilize or ask my endo about. So that's what I want the first part of this episode to be. And then we're going to go into, you know, just some things that I wish my endo told me when I was diagnosed, because again, from being almost eight years in, I'll be celebrating eight years in today's February 5th, as I'm recording in 12 days, which feels really crazy. But some things that I wish that they told me when I was diagnosed, because like after being so far in, you, you really pick up things on the way. And I wish that I didn't have to go through those like pain periods or those learning curves to figure out that and like discover it for myself. So 
just some things that I want to spread along to you to make this whole process easier. So without further ado, let's get into it. So definition number one that we are going to go through is the pre-bolus. So you may have heard the term bolus, and that simply means, you know, taking your insulin for whatever meal that you're eating. However, as far as pre-bolusing, this is the action of taking your insulin before you eat. This can be five minutes, this can be 10 minutes, or however long that you find appropriate when speaking to your endo or with your registered dietitian. Now, the, the key here is that people do this because synthetic insulin is not, it doesn't work the way that our pancreas works. You know, insulin in our, that our pancreas would otherwise naturally produce works pretty in, in, instantaneously. So it kind of sees the carbs digesting or has the carbs digesting and makes that insulin as needed. Whereas with synthetic insulin, you know, it, it can take, depending on what, which one you use, it can take like 15, 20 minutes to actually start working. So some people utilize a pre-bolus, aka taking their insulin before eating, just to meet that, that window a little bit better between the time period where your insulin is acting and then the window of when your body is digesting your food to eliminate some of that spike. Now, of course, if you're considering trying out pre-bolusing, I definitely recommend making sure that you're speaking to your endocrinologist about this and your registered dietitian, because this comes down to a lot of different things. Like your routine can play a heavily part, heavy part in it. Um, you know, you don't want to pre bolus for too long because then you run the risk of going, having a low blood sugar. So definitely bring this up to your endo before maybe testing the waters. Um, but that is definitely a huge key term that I was not aware of until like three to four years into my journey. And then I was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Like I can mitigate a lot of high blood sugars by utilizing this tool. Now, the next definition that I want to go through is time and range, or maybe we hear it as time and target. So if you're diagnosed, you've probably heard the terms like A1C or average blood sugars. And those are great reference points uh, to get give you an idea of around where your blood sugars is sitting with like the average but it doesn't really give the whole picture in that like that's just one statistic. That is just the mean. It doesn't really give you a reference point to like how frequently your blood sugar is spiking or how frequently you're going low or how much time you're really spending in that average. So the time and range is going to tell you that. If you were on a CGM like the Dexcom, like the Medtronic Guardian or like the Libre, usually their correlated apps give you this information. But if you were on um, finger prints, you can download apps like Gluco, G-L-O-O-K-O, -O -O, I believe, I don't think that there's a C in it. Um, and that can also kind of interpret the data from your finger prints to get you that information. So the time and range is going to tell you pretty much how often or the amount of time that you are spending in your target blood sugar range. So it's going to usually give you a percentage. Um, so that can range from 0% to 100%. Usually the, the higher percentage that you're sitting in your target range, the better, because that's just indicating that you're not having too much fluctuations. But most endos recommend that, you know, you're spending about 70% in this target blood sugar range. Now, also another thing to, co to consider with your endo is, you know, what does that range look like for you? Typically, you'll find online that a lot of people look between 70 and 180. So if you are going by millimoles, that is up to 10. Um, but, you know, this does change person to person. If you were just diagnosed, maybe that target range will be a little wider just as you're figuring out how to use your insulin and how different meals are affecting you. Um, but, you know, as time goes on, maybe you'll make that tighter. Mine kind of sits between 70 and 160 just because I like having it sit there just for my personal preferences and my energy levels. So time and range is pretty much just, you know, in the bulk of time, where is your blood sugar sitting most frequently? If you have a range of 70 to 180 and you're sitting there between at 70%, then you know, okay, 70% of the time, my blood sugars are sitting between that range. It just gives you a bigger look at, it just gives you more of the bigger picture rather than just an average blood sugar number where we don't really see what else is going on. So with that, I also want to mention an important, uh, an important piece of data, which is standard deviation. 
this was again, something that my endo really never told me to look at. And I don't think that they really looked at it or if they did, they didn't discuss it with me in my appointments. And again, that's standard deviation. So what does this mean for our blood sugars and how can we utilize it? So your standard deviation is essentially the amount of fluctuation or variation that you're having from your average blood sugar. So even though the average blood sugar might not tell us the whole story, the standard deviation kind of gives us that idea of, okay, how high or how low am I fluctuating from my average blood sugar? So let's just say your average blood sugar is sitting around 150 and you have a standard deviation of 40. That is pretty much telling us that on average, your blood sugar is spiking to about 190 and maybe, maybe falling to about 110. Now, of course, that isn't giving the entire story, but it just kind of gives you a reference point. And again, usually the tighter your standard deviation, the better control you have. But keep in mind, like for my preferences, I like this around 40, um, just because it gives me a little bit of flexibility where like if I'm spiking up, like I'm, I'm not gonna <laughs> get mad at myself because the typical person, even without diabetes, has fluctuations in their blood sugars. And if it's between eating a meal that I really want to eat and having a perfect standard deviation, I'm going to go with the one that offers me a little bit more flexibility. So again, this is always a, this is always a statistic that you should talk about with your endocrinologist, kind of where they want to see you and um, where you want to see yourself and hopefully coming to that compromise. Now, again, you can measure this if you are on finger pricks. It may just give you a little bit less information. Like you might not have as much information as you would if you were on a CGM, but you can of course utilize that even through that using the different reports through apps like Glucco or um, if you DM, DM me, I actually do offer also a spreadsheet that can kind of help you do that math. So feel free to send me a DM on Instagram. So next definition is insulin sensitivity. Also something that I had no idea really existed until about three or four years into my diagnosis. And insulin sensitivity basically refers to how efficiently or effectively your insulin is acting within your body. So again, like we mentioned, it takes our body about, you know, it, it can take anywhere from like 20 minutes, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit longer to really uh, utilize that insulin or for that insulin to start peaking. And basically the higher your insulin sensitivity is, the quicker it acts and the more carbs that you can cover in one unit. Now, with that being said, I wanna reference that there is no bad amount of insulin to take. Your body needs what it needs. And I'll always go back to the example of before you were diabetic, you had no idea how much insulin that your body needed at the time. So this is just referencing, you know, how effectively the insulin is being used in your body. And keep in mind, like this is a pretty hard thing to measure. So some people think that because they're on synthetic, synthetic insulin and it's taking their body like 20 minutes, like it's taking about 20 minutes for it to naturally start, that they have really poor insulin sensitivity. But keep in mind, like synthetic insulin works pretty slowly. So you don't want to kind of take that personally. So like your carb ratios don't make you a bad diabetic. Your, the amount of insulin that you need for your basal rate or your long acting does not make you a bad diabetic. Um, insulin sensitivity is really more of a tool than anything else. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about is the rage bolus. Now, first, I do not recommend rage bolusing, but we all have been guilty of it in one way or another, whether we knew this definition or not. And some, sometimes putting a term to it can help us identify, okay, maybe this isn't the action that I want to take right now. So rage bolusing basically means that you're taking more insulin than needed to bring down a stubborn high blood sugar. So if you've ever had a time where your blood sugar is sitting pretty high or on the higher side and you're not seeing it come down and you get really frustrated and you're like, I'm just going to take more insulin. And then 20 minutes later, you take more insulin and 20 minutes later, you take more insulin. Then all of a sudden you see that down arrow or you feel the low blood sugar. That is a rage bolus. Now this can get really dangerous again, because we're stacking insulin. So you want to be very mindful of how long ago your last dose was, how much of that insulin is still active in your body, and of course, what your personal correction factor is. Um, so 
be very, very careful with that. Uh, that is just to give you a term to put the name, put a name to. All right. And the next definition I wish I knew about sooner as well is a compression low. So this, this is pretty much for those people who are on a continuous glucose monitor because it can give you false readings. So I'm not sure if you've ever had it in the middle of the night, you wake up and your, your death's come randomly gives you a low blood sugar. You're like, I was, I was perfectly fine. Like my blood sugar was perfectly in range. And now all of a sudden it's telling me that I'm 40. And of course, after waking up, you're panicking because you were just sleeping. So maybe you get a juice or you go down to the kitchen and you're like stuffing your face with more carbs. And then your blood sugar is suddenly perfect again. And you're like, wait a minute, what just happened? So that is basically a compression low. A compression low is an inaccurate reading on your CGM or continuous glucose monitor caused by pressure on the device. So this can happen if you're sleeping and you roll onto the device in your sleep. Um, it can basically give you a false low reading. So sometimes if that happens to me, I like to just double check with a finger prick before treating just so that I know exactly where I'm sitting and if I need to treat. Um, just so then I'm not going really high and then causing that roller coaster. All right, we have three more definitions for you. So the next one being a blind bolus. This actually just my my co my co coach uh, who is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator taught me this. So this is taking a dose without knowing your blood sugar reading beforehand. So let's just say again, like you want to eat something, but you don't feel like checking your blood sugar. So you're not checking your CGM or you're not taking the time to prick and see where your blood sugar currently is. And then you just take your insulin for the carbs or your sliding scale, whatever you use. And uh, you just kind of go about your day. Now, this can also be dangerous because if you're sitting at a high blood sugar and you're taking your insulin, but you're not adding in like a correction for it, or let's just say that you're sitting lower and you don't actually need all of the insulin, you can go even lower. So we want to make sure that we, we have all the information in front of us, which includes our current blood sugar. Um, and if you're on a pump, you know, it's really important to plug in that, that current blood sugar so that the pump can kind of utilize all the tools and correct calculations in that way too. Um, I always get yelled at by my endo for this of not plugging in my blood sugar before. So she's like, I can't see what was happening before. And you're like, I can't tell why these lows are happening. So yeah, that is a blind bolus. Now, two more definitions. The next one is the honeymoon period. So if you are just diagnosed, maybe you are currently experiencing this, um, or maybe you are not. <laughs> but the honeymoon period is essentially a few months after your diagnosis, or maybe it's a few years. Everybody's really different, to be honest. And I don't think they really know why this happens to some people and why it doesn't happen to other people and how long it can go for or why. But the honeymoon period is essentially, you know, the, the time frame where you're pancreas is still kind of working. It's giving you a little bit of insulin. Um, so maybe you don't need a whole lot of insulin through your uh, injections or your insulin pump because your pancreas is still kind of working. So the last definition that I'm going to mention is because a lot of times when we're first diagnosed, we start on MDI, which is multiple daily injections or manual daily injections, multiple daily injections, one of the M's. So we just have this in the form of our long acting insulin. So you might take, you know, X amount of units in your long acting insulin, but then when you go on an insulin pump, if you choose to, this is changed into the form of a basal rate. So your basal rate is just your quick acting insulin, your rapid acting insulin being dripped out hourly. So it's kind of dripped out hourly. This can, this amount can change depending on the time of day, it can change depending on your activity levels and so on. But instead of a long acting insulin, you're taking your rapid acting insulin just every hour and just being dripped out through your insulin pump. Okay. So those are all of our definitions. I would love if you go onto Instagram and let me know, you know, which ones stuck out to you, which ones you just learned or didn't know about before. Again, knowing what connects with you guys allows me to make better content for each episode. But now I want to go into some things that I wish my endo told me when I was diagnosed, because there was so much emphasis placed on the physical part of this disease. Okay, how to recognize a high or how to treat a high or how to treat a low and how to recognize a low and how to count your carbs and how to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. 
that they never told me these four things. And number one is that your method of management is your choice. I have heard a lot of stories of endocrinologists or CDEs pushing one pump or the other and not really taking our personal preference into account. Some people really like having doing multiple daily injections because it gives them more freedom. Some people want the Omnipod over the T-Slim pump. And when it comes down to it, your endocrinologist can have their preferences too, but it's all in your say. So your method of management is your choice. I have a friend who she does jujitsu. She was actually on the podcast a few weeks ago. So if you haven't already, go to her episode. It is the episode with Jiggy Yoon. Um, but you know, she does jujitsu. So she doesn't want a CGM and she doesn't want an insulin pump. And at the end of the day, that is her choice. At the end of the day, you are taking your insulin and you are doing the work to take care of your body. And how you do that should be up to you. So if you have an endo that is more pushy or, you know, doesn't want to give you a say in that decision, I highly encourage you to find an endo that will listen to you and that will work with the preferences that work for you and that you are okay with. So number two that I wish my endo told me was that nobody can make you feel bad about your data without your permission. This is huge because for so long I was online and I was seeing all these people posting information or posting posts about how their blood sugars were perfect and how their A1Cs were perfect and that their time and range was perfect. And it made me feel like shit about my own, my own numbers and how I was taking care of my body. I felt like I was doing something wrong. And I felt like, you know, I just wasn't doing good, quote unquote, good enough at this disease. And that like, it just made me feel so burnt out. So it, you know, how you look at your data is up to you, your data being your time and range, your A1C. um, And this goes for your endo too. Like, your endo sees you every three months. They don't know how hard you are working or what is happening in your life in between those appointments. So how you interpret your A1C and everything in between is purely up to you. And nobody gets to tell you that you are a quote unquote bad diabetic, or nobody gets to tell you that, you know, your A1C isn't good enough. Your endo obviously is there to help you take care of your body and help with dosing changes. But again, like they should do that in an empowering way. Um, So like, Uh, I will say it again, nobody can make you feel bad about your data without your permission. Number three is that fueling your body can be an an empowering experience. So if you're listening to this and you were maybe recently diagnosed, there is a good chance that this has changed your relationship with food in some way. And I'm not saying that to be a bad thing. It's just a natural thing that happens with a disease like this. And I've gone through it twice. I've, I have type one diabetes and I also have Crohn's disease. So trust me when I say, I understand what this does because now all of a sudden we have to look at numbers. We have to look at our food as numbers. We have to look at our food as arrow directions and as a carb count and as like what our blood sugar is going to be two hours after eating this. So it really changes the way that we look at food, the way that we enjoy food and the moments that we create around food. Food is so much more than just, you know, fueling our body. Food is a cultural experience. It's traditions. It's a social experience. So it matters how we feel about food and how our relationship around food, what that looks like. So this, I believe, should be an empowering experience. So whatever diet you choose to do, if you choose to do a quote unquote diet, make it an empowered one. You know, if you're doing low carb just because just for the sake of your blood sugars, then I really encourage you to get creative and work with a dietitian or work with a team that can help you bring the enjoyment back into eating the foods that you love. So I'll say it again, fueling your body can be and should be an empowering experience and decision based off what you're eating. So last but not least, this one really hits home for me. And that's that diabetes can coexist with other areas of your life without disrupting them. I will take a second to repeat that. Diabetes can coexist with other areas of your life without disrupting them. So I feel like when we're first diagnosed, we really compartmentalize diabetes a lot. 
that being said, we have it in its own separate little box and we want to keep it there in its own box separate from everything else so that it doesn't take any of the enjoyment away from the things that we love, like our hobbies, like our career, like the time that we're spending with our family and friends and our social life and our relationships. And this is only natural that we do this. But I can say that you know, when we choose to allow diabetes to blend and mold into those other areas, it can actually enhance those experiences. We get to take ownership of this disease and we get to feel more confidence and empowerment by it. And we almost get to say, hey, like this doesn't have to completely disrupt my life. This doesn't have to be a part of me that I have to hide or that has to be taken care of in the corner or behind closed doors. This is a part of me that I can embrace and that I can love. And not only that I can love, but everybody else around me can love without it being at the forefront and the only part of me that stands out. So if there's nothing else that you take away from this episode, please let it be that or really these four things. So again, your method of management is your choice. No one can make you feel bad about the data without your permission. Fueling your body can be an empowering experience. And lastly, diabetes can coexist with these other areas of your life without disrupting them. I really hope that this episode helped you and supported you in your journey. If you got something out of it, please hit the share button, take a screenshot of whatever listening platform you are listening on and post it on your Instagram stories and tag me. And if you're feeling up to it, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts because we love to hear what content resonates with you again, so I can create more of it. And I will throw in the plug that when you leave a review, Skin Grip is giving away a free pack of patches every single week for your diabetes devices. They are the ultimate patch company. I love them so much. So that is, you know, obviously a perk of leaving a review. Thank you so much for coming on with me today. And I cannot wait for next week's episode.